Or per cow, rather. Right? That's fantastic. Yeah, who ordered that? That's great. Well, I think we're, we're ready. And we might as well get started. It gives us three extra minutes to, uh, to pick Dr. Fleur's brain. I'm so glad I'm on this side because he's been talking for four hours and now we just get to uh, have fun. <laughs> Y'all been patient to listen for four hours. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be on your side. <laughs> well, this is Dr. Fleur's uh, third time, but for some of you, this is your first time. Gabe, would you just tell the folks a little bit about yourself? You know, how, how you became a Christian, Sure. Uh, your education maybe, and some of the most uh, influential parts of that. Yeah, sure. I'll be, make it quick. Um, yeah, I was raised in uh, most of my life in Greenville, South Carolina. My, my parents were nominally Christian. Um, my mom passed away in 2021. Uh, she would take us to church, but mostly mainline liberal churches. But again, you're in the South, kind of everybody goes to church. Um, but I didn't have any, you know, understanding of the gospel, I don't think, really, until, I mean, I'd heard it, heard it at youth group and all the things, and, you know, FCA at school and all that, um, but really did not come to Saving Faith till after I graduated from the University of South Carolina. Uh, I did my undergraduate work in philosophy, and God brought me to himself through that, I would say, and uh, I was dating Callie at the time, and very foolishly, had broken up with her, and so uh, while we were broken up, um, I became a Christian. God brought another fabulous woman into her life. Um, she became a believer, and then he brought us back together, and that was uh, 23 years ago, I think. So praise God. Um, we're very, very thankful. And the, the, so from there, the guy who discipled me was actually a PCUSA pastor, and that was instrumental and um, really what began to flip the, the worm for me, the worm turned for me, so to speak, um, was listening to R.C. Sproul, uh, mm -hmm. Renewing Your Mind. So I'd heard a whole lot of things and couldn't make sense of, of a lot of it and didn't really know what the gospel was as my, the guy who was discipling me said, well, you need to read this. And he gave me some stuff by Sproul and I started listening to Sproul. And so it was just a, a wonderful thing the Lord used. Um, and then from there, he's the one who said, I think you, you've got gifts for ministry. <clears throat> and he was in the PCUSA and said, you need to get off this ship. It's sinking. Um, and he was a very conservative guy. He said, you need to go to the PCA. And so he set me up with a couple interviews uh, for internships. And one of them ended up being Second Presbyterian Church in Greenville. Um, some of you all know the name Ligon Duncan. That is his childhood church. Ligon's mom was actually our wedding coordinator uh, for Callie and I. We, we love the Duncan family. Uh, they're just amazing folks. And so this old uh, historic PCA church is where I started out. And we had a wonderful pastor there by the name of Rick Phillips. His commentary in Genesis is right back there. And Rick's a former platoon tank commander. So the joke around second pres was God loves you and Rick Phillips knows the plan for your life. So <laughs> he came to us in, in 20, uh, 2009 and said, you're either going to go plant a church or go get a PhD. I'd been working as a youth pastor in Greenville. And so we went to Westminster uh, in Philadelphia. That's where I did my, uh, my graduate work. Just an amazing experience up there. From there, we were uh, church planters in Raleigh, North Carolina. And then uh, I had the unenviable privilege of following uh, Derek Thomas twice as an evening pre uh, preacher, first in Jackson, Mississippi, and second in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, and that's what I did. So I worked at First Pres Jackson and in Columbia. And then in 2021, God called us to um, First Pres Chattanooga, where uh, I serve currently. So, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a quick thumbnail. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> I think that probably helps those who don't know you to at least have a little sense of how you can say some of the things you've said today. Okay. Because you've lived them. You've worked through so. them. Yeah. Uh, and you've studied them in his word. Yeah. Mm. Well, over the last maybe year or so, do you have a favorite book, apart from the Bible, a favorite book that you've read that's made an impact on your thinking or on your life? Oh, well. There's one I always come back to. Um, it's the sermons of a guy named Gerhardus Voss. Mm, Grace and Glory? Yes. Nice. Uh, they're, they take a lot of work to read, so as I recommend that, just know, like, if, if you're looking for, like, five steps to a better you, you're, you're going to be really disappointed by Voss <laughs> because he's just, he's hard to read. He was a very, 
Very bright guy, but I will tell you this, if you're willing to spend the time, there is just such gold in that, in those sermons he preached because he was preaching as a pastor. He wasn't just some academic. He had lived these things. So I, I always come back to boss, and then um, <clears throat> one of my professors was a guy named Richard Gaffin, and his work on suffering in the Christian life was just instrumental, the cross. Mm-hmm. So he, uh, he has... Um, a new little uh, a book that he, he taught systematic theology for 40 years at Westminster, and um, he, he just published his first systematic theology text at 83. So you talk about humility. Um, he said he didn't feel qualified to write about it till that point, after he taught it for 40 years. <laughs> but his book is called um, In the Fullness of Time. Again, not the easiest to read, but it will just repay richly anybody who's willing to take the time to sit down and just carefully think through what he's saying. So those two have been ones I come back to a good bit. No, that's great. I appreciate that. Besides those, maybe something that you would recommend that is easier to read. Mm. Yeah, on this subject, I mean, you've got a great book back there, um, uh, Living in the Light of... Is that Duguid's? Duguid's book, yeah. Relentless in Grace? The Group yeah. of Relentless Grace? Yeah, that something one? like that. Living the Light, yeah. Uh, that's right there on the back table. Grab that. That's the best little book you can read on Joseph, I think. And then just, you know, on kind of like a, a more popular level, um, my wife and I have been reading a book on contentment right now, um, and that's been super, super helpful by Nancy Wilson. Now, I know, like, she's married to a guy named Doug Wilson, and if you don't know about him, he's caused a bunch of controversy if you hear me recommend that book, let me just immediately caveat it and say I don't agree with Doug um, on, on so many things. On some things I do, on other things I don't. But what I will say is about this book in particular is she has got a very, very good take on how sovereignty fits in with suffering. And especially her chapter on contentment in the midst of grief. It is worth the price of the book. And then on just kind of a more, more popular level, I'm going through what's on, on my uh, might stand here. Um, oh, there's one recently. If I think of it, I'll tell you. Okay. Still on books. Last one on books. Is there a book that you'd recommend on the sovereignty of God? Apart from evangelism and the sovereignty of God. Packer. Maybe a more general take, like hitting this issue. On the sovereignty of God. I mean, I think you can't go wrong with John Piper. I think he's done such a good job of bringing the sovereignty of God into perspective of how it affects our joy. Um, so God's passion for his glory, which the first part is Piper, and then the second part is Jonathan Edwards. That's fan- fantastic. Uh, his book, Providence, is massive. If you don't have time to read that. <laughs> um, there's A.W. Pink. He veers off in a couple of directions that I'm not real comfortable with. Um, I think probably one of my favorites uh, is some of the old Puritan works, especially when you think about like um, suffering and the sovereignty of God, Thomas Watson Mm. and his book on the sovereignty of God is just amazing. So uh, anything by John Owen and some of the Puritan paperback series, you can get those on Amazon real cheap. Uh, Fantastic stuff. So Yeah. So now you have more books to look up. And I always want to read older writers on this kind of thing because they suffered in ways that, that are really unfathomable for a lot of us. And it was never ivory tower. So when we talk about like the Heidelberg, the Westminster Confession, most of the people who framed the Westminster Confession had buried their children, a lot of them their wives. These are men who had gone through immense persecution by the government. So it was never theoretical for them only. Yeah, no, that's great. That's helpful. <clears throat> we covered a lot of different topics today. Uh, woven in. We talked about that a little bit at lunch, how some of these things just are seamlessly woven into the fabric of Joseph's story. I want to pick up on one of those, and maybe you could kind of illuminate a little bit some of the the most clear ways Joseph's life, maybe just it's a reiteration, maybe uh, the clear ways Joseph's life points to Christ, Mm -hmm. rather than a be like Joseph, Mm -hmm. how is Joseph like Christ, or point us forward to Mm -hmm. Christ? Well, you know, kind of the things we talked about were that he was despised by his own brothers, even as Jesus was. And actually, before I answer that, let's back up and make sure we're clear on why we're even asking the question. Uh, Luke 24, 
Uh, Jesus tells us, it tells the disciples on the road to Emmaus, oh, you foolish of heart and slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer before he entered into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he unfolded to them in all the scriptures, all things concerning himself. Three times all. Okay, so Jesus, by his own admission, tells us this is how you're supposed to read the book I gave you uh, in the Old Testament. So we're not just trying to look for Jesus in obscure places. He tells us this is how he wrote the Old Testament through the Spirit. So when you look at the life of Joseph, um, you, you see his brothers despising him. You see a favored son who's cast down as Jesus himself left the favor, favor of his father. So there's always going to be similarities and contrasts. Joseph was selfish. Jesus is selfless. That's why he leaves his father's glory. Um, Joseph is cast out of his father's house, as it were, and by his brothers because of his arrogance. Jesus is the perfection of humility. Um, Joseph has to go down before he is exalted. The same thing that Jesus does is he comes down, Philippians 2, 6 through 11, to minister to us before he's exalted to his glory. So there's those major themes. I think the fact that you see him blessing his brothers and then the nations coming to him to be fed, which is such a picture of what Jesus does in his earthly ministry and ultimately in the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. So there's just, as you read the story of Joseph, as you read the narrative of the judges, as you look at the Exodus, as you look at the life of Moses, we always just want to be on the lookout to see how this is pointing us to Jesus. Yeah, that's great. I love that. <clears throat> that's one of my favorite passages at Luke 24. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then it almost repeats it when he meets with the other disciples. Mm-hmm. Like yes. Moses, Psalms, prophets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. Um, dreams. We all have dreams, right? Mm -hmm. What makes these dreams any different than the dreams we might have? (laughs) Yeah. So it's interesting to note that, I mean, one scholar says that when you look at dreams versus visions, they're different words. Hmm. And I haven't studied this enough to know if I agree with it, but I thought it was interesting that he made the point that dreams were usually used for the spiritually immature and visions for those who are more spiritually mature. So I haven't traced out that biblical data enough to know if I agree with it. But it did hold you know, some interest for me. I think when you look at the dreams that are happening here, and then let's fast forward to Pentecost, when Peter cites Joel 2 and says, your old men will dream dreams and your young men will have visions. All of this is the revelation of God, especially in the life of Joseph, in a period where God would speak to us in dreams in a way that he doesn't do in a one-for-one way to us today, Mm -hmm. okay? So he uses dreams back then. And don't misunderstand me. I love how the Westminster Confession of Faith puts it. God is free to work above, beyond, and without the ordinary means. So uh, I am not going to limit God in the wrong sense. And I don't want you to misunderstand me when I say that because people are like, you're limiting God by, you know, believing the Bible's inerrant. You're just shutting God up in a book. No, we're following what God says about himself in his book. So that's just a frustrating thing to say. But um, when we talk about dreams, I think we want to make it clear that, like, God, now that we live on the other side of the cross, the finished work of Jesus means that there's a finished revelation about that work. And I think one of the reasons we're so curious to look for other revelation from God is because we know so little of this revelation he's given to us. And that's convicting in my own life because we want, we want the easy button. Just give me a dream and tell me who to marry God. And their name and address and whatever else it is. Instead of doing the hard work of prayer and fasting and saying, God, what do you want me to do? And, and following him that way. So that's where I think it, the, the difference between the dreams they had then and today and that was the way God revealed himself during the time of the patriarchs and yes at the beginning of the apostolic era but I don't think that's the chief way he deals with us today I think it's through his word no it's great you even anticipated the question should we put any stock in our dreams today (laughs) (laughs) yeah I mean you know I have some weird dreams so it's like I'm really glad God doesn't speak to us by dreams because I'm like that was weird as one of my college professors used to say, that's the pepperoni talking. Yes, <laughs> indeed. 
All right. Um, what about prayer? You know, we, we've been thinking about suffering, and, you know, we've been called by God to pray. And we pray for healing, we pray for help, um, and we can pray that God would remove trials. Mm -hmm. Jesus prayed for that. Yep. Uh, but he also prayed, not my will, your will be done. So how do we reconcile that? And as Christians, what's the appropriate? Do we ask that God take things away that are hard, painful, mm -hmm. difficult? Or just be fatalistic in the <laughs> best sense of the word to yeah. say, well, God's got his plan. I'm just going to grin and bear it. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do we reconcile that as Christians? Mm. Yeah, I think one of the things we want to be careful about is what you just highlighted, Quentin, which is, um, Callie and I were talking about this on the plane coming over. She had been at this wonderful conference and talked about, like, when, when hardship comes, there's the response that wants to flee, wants to despair, wants to become bitter. And then there's the response of faith, which wants to cry out to God without shaking its fist at God. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we encounter difficulties, we absolutely should pray that God removes them. And we, should, we ought to pray with faith. I think a lot of times, especially kind of in reform circles, we use that phrase, if God is willing to, to kind of anticipate getting him off the hook when he doesn't show up. That's not a good way to pray. Um, when we pray for, for God to do something, he says, Jesus is absolutely unconditional in this. You know, if you believe, all things are possible. It's not name it, claim it. It's not anything like that. It is to say we, there's, there's two different um, poles here, right? There's the, oh, okay, well, I just need to say grin and bear it. Hey, God, if it's your will, which we subtly mean is probably it's not. So, you know, I'm just going to pray for this because I know I'm supposed to and I feel my sense of duty. Would you please take this away even though I don't think you will? So I'll make sure I get you off the hook by saying if you will it. Okay. There's that side, and then I think there's the other side that says something must be wrong with my faith because God isn't showing up in the way I think he should. I think the, the, the balance comes when we, we pray with faith, God, take this away, please. Yeah. And then if he doesn't, we have to be content to look for where he's working. And, the, and, and he may be leaving us to cry out to him for a season for reasons that we'll never understand, but that are always good, and that we can rely on the fact that if he doesn't answer our prayers in the way we think he should, there's something else we're learning that we might not see clearly yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's really helpful. And that's pictured for us in Joseph and Jesus' yes. life. And you've drawn that out a bit today, but maybe we could spend a few more minutes thinking about that. You, you talked about this uh, in terms of good and evil, especially in the last lecture. Mm -hmm. um, what you meant for evil, and it was evil, mm -hmm. both in Joseph's life and in Jesus' life, but God meant for good. And we live with that tension even still today. And, and we see that, we can see that pretty clearly in the Old Testament, right? You even referenced that uh, the last <clears throat> lament on the mm -hmm. cross, kind of. But then we still experience that after the cross. Mm -hmm. um, can you maybe touch on some of those aspects of, of God's purpose, um, even in hard, difficult things? Maybe even start philosophically. What is this category of, you know, God working through these evil things mm -hmm. and then bringing about his greater purposes? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, something I wish you know, probably, I probably should have spent more time on. I think we would have had time to do it. But when we think about all the evil in the world, one of the things that's easy to lose sight of is the fact that there is a real devil. I hope we all believe that and know that, like that there's a malicious enemy of our souls. And as one writer I read recently put it, you know, the battle is for our joy. And that's what, what's happening in your life and mine and every day is the battle is for our joy. Satan is going to try to destroy it through everything from horrible evil in our lives to little nagging issues in our lives. And when we think about like God's purposes in that, we have to start with the fact that he created all things good. Sin enters the world. There's an enemy of our souls. We have done much evil in this world as, a human, as the human race. 
And then if evil things are happening to us, that's when it gets really hard to believe God, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And that's where I think God gives us so many stories in his word, but ultimately in Christ. I mean, the, the evil that was done to him. And we always tend to think of that in physical categories. But I love what Sproul said. So great was the weight of bearing our sin. And so awful was what that punishment for our sin felt like on Jesus that I doubt he even noticed the nails. Mm -hmm. wow. um, and that's where we want to keep that in balance too. It's like we always think of the physical sufferings of Christ. We become like medieval Christians like that. There are all these passion plays, always focused on the, the physical sufferings of Jesus. You may have noticed when you read the gospel accounts that there's precise, there's under 10 words to describe the crucifixion in all four synoptics. They took him and crucified him. I'm sorry, under 15 words. They took him and crucified him. That's basically what they say. They don't spend a protracted, protracted amount of time on that. Describing. What they're focused on is what he's doing for us in himself yeah. as our sin-bearing substitute and righteousness. Yeah. I think that gives some perspective. I, I really appreciate that. Even as this month, we know we'll be coming to Good Friday. Yeah. And yeah, we often do think about the nails, the thorns, the yeah. agony, the, the weight of the literal cross when in fact, yeah, those crucifixion narratives really weigh uh, heavily on our sin. Mm -hmm. And that's the weight, more yeah. weighty anguish. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thanks. Mm. Um, how about some uh, advice or encouragement? You got the show... wrong guy for <laughs> advice. <laughs> how, how do we show love? How do we, maybe not show love, how do we love? You're a good Southerner. How do we love on those uh, who are lost? How do we love on those who are lost? Um, I think one of the best gifts we can give people today is to not be reactive to, to whatever their sin is. And find a way to be very sympathetic to where they are. Um, that's going to be hard if that person's an addict and you've never been an addict, which I hope a lot of people in here have not been addicts. But we can still enter into their pain and still say, I'm, I'm, I'm a fellow traveler with you. I want to help you. Um, I think that's one way to love folks. Another way is tangibly serving them. Like looking around and... and Love looks for needs and then meets those needs. That's what Jesus does for us. He anticipates our needs. And it's his delight to meet them for us. So I think that's another way. And then a, a, a huge way we love people is telling them the truth. That's why we're doing this here. We want to tell people the truth about who God is because that's the most loving thing we can do for all eternity while those other things are, are helpful to that as well. What would you add? Yeah, I mean, we're given so many examples, right? Yeah. How, I mean, it's, it's service. You know, love is giving of yourself that self-sacrificing, mm -hmm. right? Christ's the ultimate example. Um, I, th I think part of it is taking our eyes off ourselves, mm -hmm. one, right? Like, what does this person need? Mm -hmm. uh, and how and can I meet that need? Mm -hmm. Whether it's physical, emotional, or just words of encouragement. Yeah. Like, hey, I see you. You're struggling here. Yeah. I'll pray for you. I mean, Absolutely. that's minimum, right? Yeah, this, this came home to me in kind of a convicting way. We were uh, trying to get out the door to make our early morning flight on Friday, and I was waiting for Callie. Um, she is like the most punctual person, so don't read into that more than that's there. She is very, very <laughs> punctual. But I came back in, and she said, I'm so sorry, we're running a few minutes late. She said, but I just wanted to leave a note for our daughters. Mm. And it was so convicting to me because that's seeing the need and anticipating it. And I, the covenant head of my household, should have been thinking more about that. And I was more concerned with my sovereign schedule, you know. <laughs> God's so, red pencil. Red <laughs> pencil, buddy. Yeah. And guess what? I was freaking out, you know, uh, disobeying the civil magistrate's laws on speed <laughs> and getting down to the, uh, the airport. And guess what? It was like, because I told, uh, I was telling Kyle, look, like, look, I've done these commuter flights to Atlanta. This can be like the only time that Chattanooga Airport is busy. Because most of the time it's empty. And then I've been there like these early flights and there's like thousands of people in line. And then and the we computers get there. go down. And yeah, like, the yeah. computers go down. And, and we had, you know, all this stuff. So we get there and there's like four people in line. And she was like, you know, honey, I told you we'd be okay. <laughs> all that to say, you know, we, we can be inconvenienced by the needs of others at points. 
And I think part of love as well is the willingness to be inconvenienced to meet the needs of another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's the great picture of the Good Samaritan, right? Mm -hmm. Like Absolutely. All those who should have taken that time, who have yep. seen his need, didn't. Yep. And a despised person did. Yep. Yeah. And that's, I mean, we live in an area where that can easily be like just part of our life. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tracy and Jesse are on the back sidewalk. You know, how do we deal with that? I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. how do we, you know, love those who are lost? It's, mm -hmm. it's sacrificial. It's hard. Yeah. yeah. You've been working through Genesis. What's your biggest takeaway as we wrap this up? What are, you've been working through this at your church. You've gone through some of these with us. You've been studying the scriptures. As you look at the end of Genesis, even this last, you know, section, this last of the 10 genealogy sections, what's the biggest point of takeaway for you? In Genesis? Yeah. God is there. As Francis Schaeffer put it, he's not silent. And he is a savior. Mm -hmm. Those three things. And I think that, especially in our society today, we better get Genesis right. We better really make sure we're listening to what God is saying to us there because it is so beautiful to think about. Um, okay, let me just give you an example. So look at where you live. Like, y'all are pretty much aware, I, I think, that you live in a really beautiful area. Okay, so when we were driving out yesterday in the countryside, you see the clouds overhanging the mountains. Do we realize that that same God who's speaking to us here made all of this? And then you think about the fact that we plunge our, ourselves into sin. That's what happens in the book of Genesis. And the rescue God provides and this is the point, I think, of Genesis. The maker is always the savior. Mm -hmm. And this is, as one author put it, like about communism. The state wanted to be the maker and the savior. Because even though it, it was atheistic, it was trying to usurp the place of God. This is what Genesis to me is about. The, the fact that God actually speaks to us in his book. And he's the creator of everything. You can and I can have a personal relationship with our creator. Mm -hmm. Think about that. He knows everything. And he will be with us and walk with us. That to me is just mind-blowing. That's my big takeaway. God has spoken. He's there. He's not silent. And he's a savior. Love that. Yeah. And he's preparing all those pictures, even in Genesis, mm -hmm. to, to unfold them throughout the rest of the yes. scriptures, culminating in Christ, huh? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Let's bring this back finally to, uh, you called the, the lectures a triumph of faith. Maybe first a, a thumbnail definition of faith and then what that looks like for us as we live in 2024. Mm -hmm. um, I think the bet we can't do any better than Hebrews 1 to define faith. There's a classical like theological way to do it. Faith is knowledge, assent, and trust. Um, so... Uh, what that means is you have to know the right thing, you have to assent to it, and you actually have to believe it. It's like you can know that chair is there, you can understand what a chair is for, but until you sit in it, you don't really see it. That's kind of the classic like, illustration. But the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Notice those two verbs, you're sure of something. Um, I am sure and certain that it snowed in Medford, Oregon this morning. There's no doubt in my mind, okay? I, are we that sure and certain about Jesus coming through for us? Mm -hmm. So faith, I think, is that, and faith is always placing its hope in the promises of God, not what it sees. Faith does not need a verification of the word of God because it realizes that God's word is the ultimate standard. And so when we believe that and when we see that and when we begin to take that in, then faith really, walking by faith, not by sight, means walking by the promises. Understanding the promises are what are ultimate for us. And we have to, again, follow the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 11, saying these all died in faith, not having received what was promised, but have, having 
understood them. They greeted, as Abraham was, greeted him from afar. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do, was, is understand these things, greet Jesus from afar until the day we see him face to face, and keep believing when we get so many reasons in our lives not to believe. And understand that the promises are true all the time. All the time. Yeah. Mm. Well, Gabe, thanks so much for walking us through these chapters in Genesis and, and holding this out for us to, to believe, to have that faith that trusts God's promises. I'll come back to you in a second. Just want to uh, thank you all for coming, yes. uh, even through the snow. <clears throat> I know uh, snow plows helped some of you get here, maybe safe driving helped others of you get here, but you're here. And so I want to say thanks. Thanks for coming. Uh, we put these on every, every six months or so, and it, it's a necessary thing to have an audience. So thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Uh, let me also, uh, you know we can't pull this off without a lot of volunteer work. Last week we had, I don't know, probably 30 church members here cleaning and cleaning and cleaning and uh, Pastor Mark prepped everything, set tables up and the sound guys in the sound booth and our office administrator prepping everything in advance and obviously um, our hosts who, who do so much for the hospitality end and then the food prep and service. So let's give all those volunteers a huge hand. Uh, if you grabbed a, a program on your way in, if you look at the, the bottom half, you'll see our preview for next fall. We're gonna have Dr. Guy Waters back out. Uh, Guy was out here uh, once before, just a tremendous speaker, uh, a man for the church, a man who loves the Lord, who served the Lord in teaching ministry uh, for so, so long. He's delighted to come back out, and I'm so happy he's agreed to come. He's going to talk about our covenant God mm. who saves and keeps his people. So I would just want to have you put that on your calendar. Put it on your calendar today, uh, October 12, 2024. Uh, Dr. Waters here, back here for the Cornerstone Lectures. Uh, in the meantime, check out his work. Uh, when you're finished reading Gabe's and all the books that are still on the table, uh, <laughs> Google Dr. Waters, find his books, start reading. Just a tremendously clear teacher, faithful uh, to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I uh, hope to see you back here for that. Tell your friends, let's fill this room out. Uh, there's not going to be snow in October, probably. So. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Um, well, I could probably go on, but we're at our hour mark here, a half hour mark. So uh, again, Dr. Fleur, Callie, thank you for coming out. Thanks for joining us. Uh, uh, thank you for having us. Yeah. Seriously. Thank you. Thank all y'all for coming. This is, this is a wonderful place, Quentin. This is a wonderful church. We are so grateful for your kindness, your hospitality. Uh, this is, uh, I told Callie when, when you issued the invite, I said, this is one of my favorite things to do, is come out to Medford and be with you all. Um, you minister to me in so many ways, so we are very grateful to be here and thankful to you and Cornerstone for inviting us. Yeah, well, we're so yeah. glad you could make it. Would you close in prayer for us? Kate? I'd love to. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, you who have ordained the end from the beginning, you're the Alpha and the Omega the first and the last. Lord Jesus, you hold the keys to death and Hades. Behold, you were dead, and now you are alive forevermore. Lord, we ask that you would bless us as we go our separate ways today. Keep us safe in the snow. Lord, bring, bring us together for your worship tomorrow on your day. Bless the preaching of your word in the city of Medford and beyond. Lord, please bless us in our trials. Let us always remember you are with us and you love us. Help us to believe that even when it's really hard to believe. And Lord, use the life of Joseph to show us more about Jesus. And help us as we realize those things to live more for Jesus, even as you make us look more like him. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Thanks again, and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. If you're not rushing off, feel free to help move chairs and tables.